self-compassion has really been that first domino, you know, that has mm -hmm. tipped everything else forward, kind of in the right direction. I think I've come to see that, uh, you know, we've all normalized some form of self-hate within ourselves. So it's taken me a lot of unlearning. You know, I like to believe that self-compassion is really a natural state of being. Welcome to the Woman Warriors podcast. You worry, I worry, we all do. If you're paying attention to the world today, there's a lot for women to feel worried and anxious about. As we explore the worries with curiosity and compassion, we learn to live more authentically and unleash the warrior within, someone who is strong, capable, and resilient, come what may. It's time to stop battling against yourself and start using your powers to meet everyday challenges with energy, purpose, and bravery. Now here's your host, Elizabeth Cush. Today's episode is brought to you by Three Invitations to Come Home to You. If you'd like to learn how to feel more at home in yourself, you can sign up for your free invitations at elizabethcushcoaching.com. Hi, welcome back to the podcast. I'm your host, Elizabeth Cush, and I am a life coach, newly, I was going to say newly formed, but that sounds weird. But <laughs> I have a new business as a life coach, and I'm also a therapist here in Annapolis, Maryland, serving Maryland residents. The exciting part of life coaching is that I can work with women all over the world, all across the United States, all around. And that is super exciting. And I'm excited that that business has launched. So if you want to know more about me and the coaching business, you can find it at elizabethcushcoaching.com. You can also find out more about me and my therapy practice at progressioncounseling.com. I hope that you are well. I hope that you are safe and here in Annapolis, as I'm recording this, springtime is coming. It's still a little chilly, but spring is on the way. I saw tulips, the tips of tulips and daffodils breaking through from the cold ground all around Eastport, which is where I live. And I'm just so, so ready for the longer days, just right around the corner. Today, my guest is Cez Christensen, and I'm really excited to share my conversation with her. We talk about the power of self-compassion and how it's impacted our lives and how it's changed our relationship with our anxiety and with ourselves. And I just am so honored to be able to have these conversations with amazing women around the world. So let me tell you a little bit about Sez. Sez is a poet, a meditation guide, and an author, born and raised in Southern Africa. She now lives in a little cabin in Northern Denmark with her young children and husband, and where she writes spoken remedies that open up the conversation between nature and our own healing potential. From her own struggles with anxiety, unworthiness, and emotional trauma, Says has created an online audio space that helps creative empaths and sensitive beings to heal through repurposing their pain into a nourishing narrative. Through short story, poetry, journaling, and meditation, you will learn to hold space for your emotions, initiating yourself into a deeper and more tender relationship with your life again. What a beautiful thing. Well, I'm super excited, as I said, to share this conversation. We go pretty deep in terms of inner healing and our journeys with self-compassion. So let's get started. Hi, Sez, and welcome to the Woman Warriors podcast. Thanks so much for having me here. Oh, I'm really excited to get started on our conversation. But before we do, if you wouldn't mind just telling the listeners a little bit about you and what has inspired you on your journey to healing and sharing your journey. 
Okay, yes. Yeah. So I'm a poet and an author, and I currently live in Denmark. I was born and raised in Southern Africa during the end of the apartheid. So mm-hmm. I spent a lot of my childhood sort of trying to make sense of the world I was living in. And I think there were a lot of sort of paradoxes in my childhood that didn't quite make sense to me, to my child's mind. And, you know, things like a country being enforced into separation, but then personally, you know, witnessing a great love and sort of unity in the community that I grew up in. So I spent most of my young life writing poetry to make sense of all these conflicts I felt within myself. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where sort of living in the wilderness really connected me to these experiences that showed me that there was a bigger wisdom, you know, in the world that was to be understood. And I traveled a lot sort of uh, quite nomadically in my teenage years and my 20s, sort of trying to find that true sense of belonging. Mm -hmm. And I never really found it amongst people or in, you know, different cultures, but I, I certainly found it amongst plants and different landscapes. Mm -hmm. So I, I continued to write and journal these experiences that really made sense of what it was like to be a human in this world. Yeah. And I guess the Daily Heal Journal is mainly made up of these sort of audios that connect us to this greater wisdom that I feel we have within all of us. And it's um, a space of this poetry and symbolic language that kind of gives words to these conflicts I think we all feel in our lives. And hopefully it offers some intentions and tools that we can use to heal through the um, power of nature. Yeah, yeah. I find just that, and I I know now there is research, which sort of makes me laugh, but that, Mm -hmm. you know, being in nature is so healing and Mm -hmm. can sort of rewrite how I feel in my body in a way that other things just don't do. And for me, particularly being near the water has been a very healing experience. But can you tell us a little bit about just your, I know you share pretty openly that you have struggled with anxiety yourself. And I certainly have. And I think a lot Mm -hmm. of the listeners who tune in do or have just how this journey for you has helped you heal that anxiety and anxiousness in yourself? Sure. I think I've suffered mostly most of my life with anxiety, but I've learned to live better with it for the last sort of eight years. And I really used to believe it was some form of, you know, a mental illness of some kind from being too sensitive Mm -hmm. as a child. And I spent a lot of time trying to fix myself. And I think since becoming a mother, I've learned that there is a lot more profound and a deeper healing to be had when you learn to live with it rather than just trying to eradicate it from your life, you know? Yes. Yes. (laughs) So I, I kind of realized that it was more my relationship with that word anxiety that kind of hurt me most, more than the actual physical symptoms of anxiety. Mm -hmm. It was um, sort of labeling it. And I kind of, at the moment I use the term anxiety, I don't really use it. I've uh, restoried it, I guess. Mm -hmm. And I call it a, a deeper soul sickness that is trying to remind me to return back to my body and back into touch with what is real and you know, what is in this present moment. And I think sort of that reframing of it has really helped me and kind of changed the relationship I had with it. Mm -hmm. Um, I remember when I was on my first flight as as a new mother on my own, and I was trying to deal with the fears and anxieties I have over flying. And 
in the midst of a pretty severe panic attack alone on this flight with my four month old baby. Oh. I, yeah, I suddenly realized that because of the state I was in, I couldn't help. I couldn't help my, my child. So in that sort of inward asphyxiation, I suddenly turned towards a more kind of selfless outward attention. And I, I really started, you know, wanting to deal with it, this anxiety for the sake of someone else. And I think that's also really helped me is turning. I have to be a better person for somebody else, you know, Mm -hmm. and I've came up with this mantra. I think at that very point in time on that flight, I came up with this saying that if you turn away from yourself right now, you won't be able to help. And that brought me a lot of healing over the last few years. I've kept repeating it in various ways. You know, if I turn away from myself, all aspects of who I am, I won't be able to help anyone, you know, let alone myself. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So that's, that's been a healing journey. Yeah. And I think it's so powerful to say too, that the turning inward that that really like the helping yourself as you turn towards yourself allows you to then more easily turn outward and help others too exactly because you can't you you literally what can you do what can you offer if you're completely empty and turning away from yourself seems to be a very easy thing for us to do you know we're really taught to give and give and give but very Mm -hmm. rarely do we really know what it's like to receive you know Mm -hmm. to receive some kind of receive calm receive goodness you know we're taught just to give that all away but very it's very hard and at least it's been a big learning process for for myself to really learn how how to give from a place of fullness rather than you know that empty empty Mm -hmm. and drained place. I think we all know. (laughs) Oh, so, so much. Yes. And giving from that place of fullness. Mm -hmm. But as you said, being able to receive both, I think from ourselves, which I think is probably Mm -hmm. the hardest part is to really give ourselves that compassion and love and understanding, even in the hardest times. Yes. But receiving from others too, I have had Mm -hmm. many conversations with women who quickly will brush off a compliment or, uh, you know, some acknowledgement of their skills or their whatever, just, yeah, Yeah. just some, and that for me too, was such a hard thing for a long time to just be able to take in what someone would say to me (laughs) about me and just say, thank you, you know, like, Oh, I, I totally can, resonate. I can receive this. Yeah. yeah. I think there is some deeply false narratives we all hold within ourselves, you know, that when we feel like we, we can't receive, if there is some underlining story in us that is saying that we're not, you know, worthy of receiving this. There is some kind of story within us that's saying, you know, that's rejecting this ability to receive because we we truly don't feel like we are what we have is worthy of receiving that that beauty or that compliment or that yeah. even the simplest of things it's been definitely my journey as well yeah yeah but too and how lovely it is when we can receive these things and yeah. take them into our heart you know it's mm. such a it absolutely can be a very connecting experience with other people isn't it such a, it really, exactly like you say, there is some connection that you feel that's sort of untampered with when you really open your heart and you receive something from another person, you know, mm-hmm. without that shame that usually gets in the way, you know, yes. it's uh, like you say, very connective. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things that helped me find you, I think someone must have shared one of your poems Mm-hmm. or something on social media. And I went and bought your book, Healing Her, and have found just so many touch points for me. You know, reading it oh, has really been lovely. But mm-hmm. talk, to, talk to me about how writing has supported your journey. It sounds like you've been 
writing for most of your life. Yeah, I really have. I I don't know what it was that really connected me to that practice. I think it has been the journey of all journeys. It's been the thing that's brought me back to my wholeness more than any other practice I know. I I think it's from some kind of self-reflection, I can see that there is a cathartic process of taking some sort of pain within yourself and manifesting it into something, you know, like even if it's art or music, that creative process of taking it out from within your bones, you know, and putting it out into the world has been a really healing process for me. And at least writing it, it's like nature. It's very similar to nature in that way that it holds space for you Mm -hmm. in a way that not many people, rarely people or other things can, can, you know, it's the space holder for all aspects of your yourself that you are, at least I feel quite ashamed for some of the things I can't share, at least uh, with Mm. other people. It's, I can always share it with my books, you know? Mm, Yeah, yeah, (laughs) yeah. And to be, and I have not published a book, but being on a, you know, putting my voice out into the world through the podcast Mm. and writing blogs for my website, like to be seen in a way Mm. that one feels safe, but also allows you to just kind of show yourself. And I would, I, mm. I would imagine publishing a book feels somewhat the same, vulnerable and good yeah. at the same time. <laughs> and and super scary, you know, yes, all, the, yes, all, yes. All, all the things that, you know, just, you know, really uh, bring up all those anxious feelings and, and things. But I think healing is a really cyclical process. You know, when you stop at yourself. If you start, if you write and you write it for yourself, I kind of, I believe that you've only gone half the circle, you know, Mm -hmm. and it's putting it out in the world and sharing that vulnerable part of you with others that kind of completes the circle because it's other people really that complete that circle for you, that healing process. Mm -hmm. So that ability to share that is so you know, like you say, vulnerable and scary, but also deeply beautiful. It's like that receiving, that open-hearted receiving mm-hmm. that really f- completes that circle of healing for me, at least. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree that it really allows you to fully show up and then mm. sort of be received by others too, which yes. is, is, is a really lovely thing. Yes. I would love to read one of your poems, if I oh, might. please, please do. So this sort of speaks to, I feel a little bit about what we were just sharing is that, you know, the healing process really mm. takes you showing up in the world in a different yeah. way. So the poem I'm going to read is My Voice. Oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> My voice became a tool and lost its silence. My body became a conduit of self-love and lost its abuse. My mind became still and lost its dominance. My heart became a home and lost its longing. This is how we live awake. It's just so beautiful. It's it's more beautiful hearing it from you. <laughs> I like, you know, I've read it in my own mind so many times, but it's very touching to hear someone else read it. Thank you it, for that. Oh, it is. And it just, I've read it a few times to friends and like, it Mm. brings tears to my eyes because (laughs) I feel as if there's just so, so much like within healing, it it's, Mm. it is your body and your voice and your mind and your heart that have to, that all are a part of that process. Yeah. And I think you just, stated it so beautifully thank you it's like a it's a life's journey that poem you know only it a few is. lines that kind of describes that entire journey where yes. we're on yeah yes 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 oh so hmm. I know a lot of what we're talking about here the healing journey needs a lot of what we need for ourselves is to be compassionate and have self-compassion for all of it. The anxiety, the struggle, the maybe the past mm-hmm. trauma, those wounded parts of ourselves. And I'm just curious about 
your journey with self-compassion and how that's impacted you and your life. Sure. Yeah. Self-compassion has really been that first domino, you know, that has Mm -hmm. tipped everything else forward kind of in the right direction. I think I've come to see that, uh, you know, we've all normalized some form of self-hate within ourselves. So it's taken me a lot of unlearning. You know, I like to believe that self-compassion is really a natural state of being. Mm. And when I see it like that, when I see that there is not this inherent faultness in myself, I can better come back to that natural state of being because it's not really an action. It's more letting go. Mm. I can let go of that critical judgmental voice in my head and, you know, naturally fall back into place into this loving state of being. But It's definitely been a process because when you start becoming aware of how you really talk to yourself and especially having children, you would never say these things that you tell yourself to your children, Mm. you know, and why that love is different for your child rather than yourself. That is one big mystery. But when you can start talking to yourself, like, you know, like you do your child or you do your loving pet or your, your partner, Mm -hmm. you know, there's a very different relationship that you can start to cultivate within yourself. It's like this friendship that, you know, that you've always longed for, or this base holder that you've always been longing to be with. Mm -hmm. And you, you naturally, at least from, for myself, it was a lot of hard work in the beginning to kind of monitor the the things I was saying to myself. But after really not a long time, it became more natural to think the good things about mm-hmm. myself than it did the bad, you know. Yeah. And, and yeah. that has been such a deep, deep process for me. And it has been brought about the most change. Out of all those incremental small changes we we try and make, that has been like, it's some form of self-savior, I really, really That's believe. Lovely. That is a beautiful way to put it. It's interesting. I had an experience recently, and I have also been on a journey of practicing self-compassion. And I credit that to, to me really better relating to my anxiety, too, is being yeah. compassionate for the times that I am anxious. But I uh, recently had a moment where I did something that I wasn't super proud of and automatically went to that mm-hmm. critical, judgmental, shaming part of me that wanted to kind of mm-hmm. point out all the ways I had done things wrong. And like, I took a moment and took a deep breath and just sat with like, this is so hard and gave myself the compassion that I, I knew that I needed, but just shifted that dialogue internally. Mm -hmm. And just the physical, (laughs) how I felt physically shifted so dramatically. I I'm not sure I've had that same experience again, but Mm -hmm. it was from distress and sort of shame and turning inward to a letting go and mm. opening up and mm. just allowing that I'm human and I sometimes screw things up. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and isn't that beautiful? Because, you know, I don't think we're going to stop screwing up. I, no. I think you know, that is, that's, kind <laughs> I know. Of, that's part of life. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but if we can relate to ourselves when we do, when we inevitably screw up or do something that you know brings us we're not proud of yeah yeah Yeah. then at least if we can say you know what I acknowledge it but be kind to yourself through it I think we just come out of it like you say you know we come out our bodies come out of it so much better they've let go of that hate or that shame that probably at least for me would have followed me around for a few days you know yes Yes. Yes. I'm toxic in your body. Yeah. 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 And (laughs) huge physical shift, emotional shift. It just changed my whole day, Mm. really, literally. Beautiful. Yeah. Mm. So I know for me too, writing has been not always a part of my life, but has all come back into my life as a very important part of it. Self-expression, but just writing to 
to share as well. If there were listeners who weren't really sure either how to journal or ways to bring writing into their lives. Do you have mm. any ideas or recommendations? Yeah, of course. I think like like many people, I've sort of journaled as a witness uh, for most of my life. Mm -hmm. But something really changed when I started journaling from a different perspective, which may help some of your listeners and you don't need to be, you know, an avid journaler, or you can also be like myself, who's detailed their mm. entire life down. So when you're writing from a witness point, you would usually say that, you know, this happened to me today and I felt like this. Um, so you're writing in this first person narrative. But if you shift it to an intentional journaler, you will take a moment before you start writing, you just take a moment to breathe and connect to your heart or, you know, your highest wisdom or your most loving self, you know, mm -hmm. and you do this either through meditation or music or, you know, a gratitude practice. You just get yourself in that space of a little bit higher than this uh, microscopic view you currently have. And mm. then you write to yourself in third person. So you could say something like, you know, I know you're going through a hard time right now and I know you feel lonely or this, what you're going through is really difficult and it's okay. It's okay to feel this way and it's okay to take your time to come back to yourself and be good to yourself and just know that you're loved and you're so worthy and keep finding that light you know within yourself so you so you offer yourself some hope and some kind of solution rather than filling up these books and books with this kind of narrow perspective of your life that isn't really representational of the fuller parts of your life. You know, it's a bit like social media. You just see one clip it mm -hmm. in your journal of these very difficult times or these joyous times. But if you can write from that third person perspective, even just intermittently, like once a week, write yourself this note that kind of gives you this intentional way forward and way out. And when you start to look back at this piece in your journal, when you start looking back at these pages, you can really see a lot more progress because you're looking at how you're dealing with the problems. You know, you're not looking at the problems themselves because like for me, my problems are pretty much the same all the time, but <laughs> yeah. the way I deal with them, you know, mm. that changes and that really shows the progress that I'm making. And I think that's a lot more valuable than just being a witness. Yeah, that's lovely. That is beautiful. I love that idea. And yeah, being, and again, I think it it incorporates some of that self-compassion, right? I see yeah, where exactly. you are. I see where you are and how hard this is. Yeah. yeah. Mm, that's like a lovely. best friend. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Oh. oh my goodness. Well, says it was so such a lovely time talking to you. I've enjoyed our conversation so, so much. And I think this is what I love about podcasting is connecting with other women who all around the world, which is amazing. It's such a privilege. But if the listeners wanted to know how to find you and your work, how would they do that? Yes. Yeah, so all the links can be found on my website, which is called the dailyhealjournal.com. Nice. And you can connect to these videos and poetry that I record on Instagram, which is also called the Daily Heal Journal. All the information should be on that one website. Yeah. Nice. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thanks again so much for being a guest on the podcast. And I look forward to continuing to follow you on social media and being a part of your work. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. This week's episode is brought to you by three invitations to come home to you. We all have different parts or voices we hear that can influence how we act, how we feel, and how we engage with the world. When we can get curious 
and learn more about all of our parts with compassion, we begin to feel more at home in ourselves. I'd like to invite you to explore some of your parts with the three invitations to come home to you. When you sign up, you'll gain access to the prompts that will be your guide to help you get to know you and your parts a little bit better. To get access to your prompts and find out more about working one-on-one with me, go to elizabethcushcoaching.com. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. I know that I did. And as I said in the interview, I, the thing about podcasting for me is talking to amazing, beautiful, creative women around the world at just hearing their journey of healing, their journey of creativity, their journey to finding that love for self that they can then share in the world is just, hmm, it just speaks to my soul. And it is something that I want to be able to help other women to find that, to find that place in themselves that they love, that they care for, that they can call home. So again, if you wanna know more about coaching with me, you can find me at elizabethcushcoaching.com. So it's my name plus coaching.com. I want to share one more poem from Says. I, as I said, her book, which is called Healing Her, which we didn't really talk too much about in the interview, but a beautiful book, one you should buy if you love poetry and women and soul-filled journeys. The poem I'm going to read is called Stars That Burn. And it speaks to me because I think it demonstrates it to me, reflects the power of turning towards ourselves to find that inner peace and calm and how that reflects out into the world. Stars That Burn. Stars that burn the brightest are those which are condensing, becoming quieter more potent in yourself means burning in a silence that thunders throughout the universe. I hope all of you have a beautifully thunderous week ahead, and I hope that you will do some reflecting on yourself, your journey, finding some self-compassion for wherever you are and maybe spending some time journaling in the third person, as says suggested. Have a wonderful week. Ciao for now from This Woman Warrior. Thanks for listening to today's episode of Woman Warriors Podcast. The information in this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health professional. Music was written and performed by Andy Cush. If you'd like more information on this episode, you can find the show notes, the resources shared today, and links to the guest profiles at womanwarriors.com.